Right, welcome to um, day two, or uh, day three, I guess, of Black Lives Matter Week of Action and Day. My name is Angela Crawford, and I help uh, to organize this event um, and a few events during Black Lives Matter Week uh, in action. I am a educator of 22 years. I am currently in Martin Luther King High School, where I'm the academic teacher leader for English. Um, so, how did I come up with this topic of colorism? Um, so that uh, we all have our stories and houses to share. So I'm a brown skin sister, and sometimes um, I'm not on the other one end of the spectrum of being a light skin sister or the dark skin sister. But how does that affect me? My mother's a dark skin woman. My grandmother's a dark skin woman, and I'm listening to um, you know recalling back to the stories that my mother shared um, about her scars of being a dark skinned woman and, and thinking about how um, she even looked at some of my friends who might have been light skinned and, and having her, um, her thought processes because of some negative experiences that she had growing up and someone telling her that she wasn't good enough or she wasn't pretty enough or she wasn't worthy enough and how she really tried to do the opposite thing for me and to empower me. So it, and I heard all those things growing up, but I didn't really kind of understand the impact of it um, until like things were starting happening. You go, you, you know, you're teaching and you're in school, and you see how children treat one another, and you see where you know this one gets a preference, where this one doesn't get a preference, and not just for females, but for males too. So for my dark-skinned brothers in the classroom, you know, he has the hoodie on and he looks like maybe he's a thug and he don't want to participate so I'm gonna think he's the negative person in the class but you know I got the light-skinned brother sitting he got the curly top and you know the girls like him he's charming and so now the teachers looking at him different so I'm taking all these things in account because outside you know side note, I've been a teacher but I'm also work with teachers and I'm going in classrooms observing so watching all of these things um, looking at how students interact with each other, um, not just in high school, but also in middle school and, uh, you know, on the playground, you know, calling little kids, you know, blackie and all these type of things like here had to really make me think about what is the psychological impact of black children having these issues amongst, in our own community, amongst ourselves. And where did it come from? So, you know, I started to dive a little, dive a little dark, um, deeper into this topic and really started having conversations with people and became kind of more intrigued outside of my personal experience or the stories of my mother or the observations that I've seen um, throughout my uh, school career or just, just out um, listening to young folks um, and having, conversation. So that's kind of why I kind of got like really I'm passionate about this topic is because it's really truly affecting um, our, it's, it's affecting our community but on a larger scale if we look at who's teaching our children. So if you look at teacher education programs they're basically young white females teaching our students. And what happens if the young white teacher has these preconceived notions that I've observed in the classroom? So if one is dark skinned, does that mean they're less intelligent than another? Does it mean that because one is light, they are perceived to be intellectually superior than another? And like, how am I supposed to um, help make an impact with people and people that I had to work with as a teacher leader um, what am I supposed to do with that? Because they come in with the bias that no one wants to talk about. We talk about curriculum, we talk about what to teach, but no one is checking their biases at the door to say, how do I look at you as students in my classroom? So tonight we're going to um, view some clips. We're gonna start with um, some video clips from Dark Girls. And we're gonna have some conversation. This is definitely not a me um, speaking only because I'm sure that everyone in this room has a story. 
something intrigued you this evening that you wanted to participate and be involved and listen. So, this is definitely an interactive experience. Um, it is a discussion. So, let's talk about it because the only way the healing starts is to have conversations. The only way to deconstruct our biases is to admit that we have them and start talking. Hey, I see. We are able to look at them and see it. When I first saw Megan, I said, this is black. Because I could see it right away. And it's, it's how many of you ever saw the movie Imitation of Life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. talking about your history. What the man is saying is that the, respectfully with your story, they're more the exception than the rule. Right. No, 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 I'm not attacking you. Right. But their, but their exception is more the exception than the rule. But we're talking about a wounded people trying to teach. There are those that us who are, are, are wounded, and we have no idea until you've been very fair and you've been wounded, called black, and people walk around trying to get this bleaching cream so that they can have a life. There is wounded, this slavery has wounded so many of us that, you know, to irreparable damages some, in some cases. I'm an English teacher, English professor here um, in the English department, and I showed darkness for the first time in my women's studies class last semester. And it was a very diverse class, and it blew most of them away watching it. But so much of that clip resonates with me. Um, my mom is um, of a darker complexion than me, and all growing up, we would hear all the time, like when they would see her, oh, that's your mother? Like, surprise. And she would take it on the chin, but. Um, all throughout our lives, right? Now everyone says we look alike, like I've grown up, but before there were like distinctions being made all the time in my house even, not by her and not by my sister who's also closer to like my mother's complexion than I am, but just these ideas of like, I couldn't relate to some of their conversations, my sister and my mom, like what they have been through, right? Like I didn't have those type of scars, but even in school, right, we would make those distinctions. In elementary school, they would, right? We're darker skinned girls, and we have these different terms in black communities that we use to make those distinctions. And we learn it so quickly and so easily, and there's just so, so much of that resonated with me, sort of how colonization fits into it, too. I remember like my first trip to South Africa, I was with a, a, a girlfriend of mine of darker complexion, and everywhere we went, like socially, I was getting like a lot of male attention. This is not me trying to be like super thing. <laughs> I have a point, I promise. But we were, and, like, we were going out and I, I got some male attention. And I think she's gorgeous, even more gorgeous than me. We were talking one night and she's from, originally from Sierra Leone. So she had been to um, Sierra Leone many times, but never to South Africa. We were talking one day and she was like, is it just me or like, even here, they're like really, Feeling you, and I'm just like I know I've never felt light skin before, right? Like I also don't subscribe to those kind of distinctions, but there it was like it was pretty obvious, right? That they sort of um, ranked the closer you are to whiteness, the more reward you get, which is sort of what we do in American society as well, right? The closer you are to whiteness, the more you're able to imitate whiteness, the more you're rewarded in our society. And yeah, I think that dark girls does such a great job, especially later on when they give you black men talking about their preferences in the video, I love those parts. Because we talk, because then we can talk about like internalized racism, how we like internalize these things within our community, and how black men are placing all this value on all of these like um, things that we learned from colonization and slavery. Hi. Um, she talked about um, when she was younger and people would say, is that your mother? I got that the same way, but the other way around, because my mom is actually light skin and they would all go is that your mom is she mixed what is she and I would go no she just likes it and then they would always go but you're so dark and then they would go oh then I would go okay if my mom's light what does that tell you and they never got that that meant that my dad was dark right. and then they never got that ever I would have to show pictures like yes this is really my mom here are my baby photos with her holding me this is my mother um, and I also, when we're talking about um, colonialism and talking about the status and the house and, you know, and the plantation, 
I know it's a bit disturbing, but me and my mom, we have had conversations. We meet, and she even turned into like, I say it's like a disturbing game. Because she's so light-skinned, we would talk about, you know, if we were back then, where would we be in the house? And because she's so, so light, I would be like, you, you would probably be a house slave. You really would. And then I was like, well, where would I be? Because I'm so dark. She was like, you know, well, you probably wouldn't be in the field because you're larger, so maybe you'll be in the kitchen. So we've had these discussions before, and it is disturbing, but I like that at least, at least, you know, we're talking about it, you know, so it's not like um, weird or something like that. And also, um, I never kind of felt that, um, you know, I was unattractive because I was darker, and funny enough, my mother thought she was unattractive because she was light-skinned. She thinks I'm beautiful, and she thought that she was unattractive. She thought her skin was pasty and things like that, and she told me that might be one of the reasons why she really um, likes dark men, because she was not happy with her skin. Mm -hmm. Sister, um, she um, passed away now, but um, the complexions of my siblings, I'm one of six, run the gamut, my mother's darker skin, um, and our, we have, um, different fathers, she, she lost uh, uh, her husband, remarried, and he was mixed. And so my younger siblings are much lighter. Mm -hmm. And one of my sisters, um, she grew up with a lot of issues around being too light for um, black girls and too dark for white girls. And she had a lot of issues and I, you know, and it was the first time that I thought about complexion in that way. Um, and then having friends and, you know, and being, becoming sensitive to that because she used to get in a lot of fights because it was assumption that she thought she was pretty or she thought she was too good looking simply because she was lighter skinned. And so um, and she used to get bullied by darker skinned girls because of the assumption that they thought that she was already thinking this way about herself. Um, and she didn't, but that, you know, and, and growing up and having, talking about colorism with other peers and this idea that, you know, the struggle that lighter skinned women are facing within their peer groups, not within the hierarchy of society and that thing, but within um, their relationships with other women um, and the assumptions around that. And um, so I'm really glad that these conversations have, are, are, that we're having them. And I, but I also want to bring up, you know, the, you know, that, that the nuance around that complexity around um, the, the assumptions that we're not just making around dark skinned women, but the other way around and you know, and introducing, because I know uh, my sister never knew how to find language for it or talk about it. And some of the, my peers, um, women who are lighter than me, also feeling like um, they're not, sh like the, the challenge around having conversations um, uh, with other women um, when it comes to this conversation. So I just wanted to um, bring that into that conversation. Uh, I just wanted to uh, get to the, the, what you mentioned, the colonialism, and how that has impacted upon us and as a people. Um, well, for many of us who know taking some of the social sciences, sociology, and those things, we know that um, it is the dominant culture that basically sets the value system, which also embraces what? What beauty is. And certainly it wasn't us, and as what was said there, when we take a look at um, um, the fact is, is that we were not even seen as human, yet alone beauty, seeing something wonderful in us. Um, again, the dominant culture has been the one who has been saying, what is beauty? And we know that uh, these children, hybrid or the children, mulatto, came as a result of black women being what? Rape. 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 You know, and those kind of things. But keeping in mind that they are still us. We, as the Jamaicans say, we are one. And so we have to find a way to get around that because it still kind of trickles down and it separates us. Um, uh, what has happened, we talk about this issue, and I'm a product of, I'm a, I'm a boomer, a product of the 60s when we went through some of that, when it was wonderful that said loud, I'm black and I'm proud, James <laughs> Brown. But that was a wonderful time for those of us who were of the darker hue. 
uh, we may remember, and we know that a lot of that that self hatred uh, uh, of of being called black. You see the pain in the little girl. Some of you may be familiar with um, the 1953 Brown versus Board of Education when we talk about Mamie and Alvin Poussaint doing what? Using as a part of their argument in the Supreme Court, what? The Dolls Test. Mm -hmm. And the little girls rejected the black dolls because it looked, because it looked like them. And you know, so today, um, many of us, some of us wanted doll babies that looked like us, but there was a time in our history that we did not because so much negativity, so much was reflected with um, negative about being black. So let's see. And of course, you know where um, those who, the other part, the socioeconomic background, as I learned, <laughs> you know, from some of my professors. I've taught SOCH here, but also coming through African-American schools, taking African-American history courses, which is important, and it helps us to understand this whole phenomenon um, uh, that the socioeconomic background that we take a look at when we look at the, the, the classes, the middle class, but we are inside of that because as I heard someone else say, I believe it's either there, but I heard it said that socioeconomically, light-skinned individuals is what determined what the black middle class was. So it's a matter of going back and learning our history. John Franklin Hope and some of the great black writers, his, yes, I'm sorry, I backed it around, thank you. But uh, these are people that wrote about this understanding to help us better understand what it is that happened uh, in this thing called slavery and the impact uh, 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 of it on black people and how it even impacts upon us today, especially when we talk about our men, you know, and how they look at us, some of the things that were said about black women and how, you know, we do so much um, in trying to look like what it is that they want, and then what happens when the light is not even good enough for our black man, that they have to go and want that which is a part of the dominant culture. So it, it, it's, it's just an interesting thing, but I think that learning our history, those black history courses are, are quite important for us even as a people, as a woman, you know, um, and I, as I've taught some of the uh, sociology classes, it's amazing how when they're coming from the Philadelphia school system or many school systems that there are sometimes whites who know a little bit more about our history than we do and there are classes where they're black that no one knows anything about our history. But one of the things I just think is that we have to be careful. It's important to understand where all of this comes from because we cannot afford to be divisive. Mm -hmm. Who's training that eye? And that really is the, the, the problem and the issue. We have to deal with the miseducation of the Negro that, um, by Carla G. Woodson. The problem is that color and colorism and racism is an invention. It was an invention to divide and conquer. And it's a fairly new invention if you look, to look at the African continent and the greatness of the African continent. And when we actually came over as enslaved African people and after enslavement, then we move into the issue of how do you divide and conquer and destroy these people who are a mighty people, extremely strong and powerful, able to survive enslavement while inventing and creating and rolling and developing and creating institutions. We had colleges and universities while we were enslaved. And we had the first universities in the world. The problem is we don't know, we're not trained, who's training the eye? We don't know our own beauty. I never even in my entire life, and I am a boomer, I never in my household once, not once, heard my family discuss our skin color. And we, we were all black people. We never, so it wasn't in my mind to discriminate against myself, because that's what you do. 
When you're black and discriminate on color, you discriminate against yourself. It was never a part of our life. And I didn't know until I went to college that first of all, I lived in the ghetto. Second of all, that, um, <laughs> because that's a sociological adventure. Um, and then, and second of all, that there was this issue. I didn't know my own dad was light skinned until, and we lived in the house together all our lives because we never called each other by our color. So it said also in there, we lost our names and became a color. So when we stopped, when we stopped understanding that we were Yoruba or Igbo or Anyway, or when we stopped understanding that and somebody else started to define us, to tell us who we are, started training the eye, then we start issues of color. If we start teaching our history yes. of Africans, yes. Yes. of our greatness, of our strength, yes. if we look at the kings and the queens and the people, the farmers, the welders, the carpenters, those were, because when they went to Africa to get people to come, they didn't say, give me your tired, your poor, your breathless, those yearning to be free. They say, give me your carpenters, your engineers, your welders, because they brought over the skills and trades. They brought over the farmers. We invented rice farming as enslaved people. They went for the greatest minds ever, and that's who they tried to bring over. So then how in the world could we have people of African descent be talking about who's cut, who's light, who's dark, who's good. We are the strongest, most beautiful people on earth. And it doesn't matter about the division of color because then we are a rainbow of beauty like roses. Mm -hmm. uh, roses of what? I don't understand young people with this, this colorism. You are beautiful. The dark. I always thought I was dark and I never thought it was a problem. I always loved it. And my father's light skin, I loved him. I never knew the difference because he was a great man. And the last thing I'll say, he didn't teach us how to pick our mates based on their color, but it was their skill and their intelligence and what they could do. And since all of my uncles could also work and have businesses and could cook and clean, I thought all men could cook and clean. <laughs> 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 So see, I married an intelligent one that can cook it. <laughs> She just um, graduated from college, so that could have contributed to that. I don't know. I think that the point where we need um, some more African American teachers teaching African American history is a good point because I think that while a white teacher can learn the facts and figures, they can't really learn the feelings that come behind what they're teaching. That's one of the demands of the teachers. Yes, more exactly. And that is one. How they are exposed to so many different things. Mm -hmm. Of the mom. I have four daughters. I have my oldest is dark like me, and she's delighted. And we experienced that. Is that your real mom? She's like, is there another kind of mom? Another mom besides that one? Um, and there were conversations I picked up on that I had to deal with because she came home one day and was like, I'm pretty because I have like, I'm light skinned and have long hair. I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Where did that come from? Like that's not a conversation we had in our house. Yeah. But just finding a way to help each one of my daughters identify as beautiful, no matter what shade you are. Um, and then the conversation, you know, with their father, it's like, I remember when they were small, when I first had this, I was kind of traumatized. Like, what? He said, I want you to look like you, but they need to be light like me. Oh. 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 Okay. So I said a lot of other things in response to that because I'm going to be able to But just trying to help my daughters navigate that experience because in reality, most of his family is light and most of my family is dark. And just trying to help them understand that we're all like multiple shades of beautiful, like you said, and helping my daughters not be isolate themselves as individuals 
because of that experience and also any harm and trauma that I have in being pretty for a dark skinned girl. Not mm -hmm. let that reflect on my daughters that are much fairer and having them, you know, be able to navigate the world from a different lens than what I experienced. So, you know, I actually, no one else wanted to come besides her. <laughs> but I'm, you know, it's important for me to bring her into this space because we had these conversations. We were forced to have these conversations in our household because the things that are being taught outside and bring into your home. So I think that, you know, as we begin to navigate those systems, we have to be aware that other things are coming into play um, much different than what my parents had, you know. Some of us, you know, we have the loud voices to speak about, you know, Oh, it's for the black community, it's for this, it's for that. But then you get into your complacent mode. You get paid, right? Everything's looking up. It's, you know, this is the society, and people, you know, saying hi, how you doing, Miss and Miss. And you forget that these things are happening. But I was flipping through my my phone, and I saw something in Jamaica where they had this bleaching cream, and they would have bleaching parties. They were uh, they were bleaching everybody, just advertising that they want to be this type of color. And if you if you didn't bleach, you went in the A crowd. So now this video is going viral, and some of the young people in the U.S. is now picking up money. So I don't you know I don't know where that comes from as far as like taking straight up the bleaching cream out of the uh, convenience store and just rubbing it on their faces and on their arms. And, and, and they're telling us why they're bleaching themselves. They're telling us that this is the way to be. I don't think it's the right. Mm -hmm. It's their reality. So there's definitely um, lyrics. There's a Jamaican song where it, it speaks to just that, and <clears throat> the girls aren't beautiful. They're not doing it. Um, we even know we don't hear so much about it in the United States, but it is because if you think back to the '80s. That ambi cream, mm -hmm. yeah. you guys like the cream, right? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You must have been blotch out, but it was yeah. light cream. Mm -hmm. So it might have been, it may not have been labeled like the ones that you see in some of some of our islands, but it's it's still real. And they got people going to extremes, and they're doing this whole um, pro body process, yeah. and mm -hmm. they got some type of like sandpaper and it hurts to yep. or try to move the, the layer of the skin and put so they can get a lot. I, 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 can't, I can't even fan them because mm -hmm. first of all, I'm not rubbing sandpaper on it. Right, right. So I can't fan from this whole process that people um, are putting yourself through pain and agony to look more white. It's important, like you were saying, that we need to teach each other. I don't care what shade you are, people of color, black folks, everyone, because it kind, of, it kind of brings to mind, I don't know how many people in here are familiar with Dr. John Henry Clark. Mm -hmm. A few people, right. Mm -hmm. So he said something that was very powerful to me and when he talked about the oppressor, right? So it was a couple different things very quickly. The oppressor will invite themselves to your home mm -hmm. and then we'll let them in. And if you know anything about you know, African history dating back thousands and thousands of years ago, what we have, we've always been inviting of people. We've looked at other people as, you know what, yeah, you might be a different color, you're from a different place, but we're still going to invite you into our culture and how we live and what we see. And then what happens, you invite the oppressor to dinner, they leave the master, you leave the slave. And also another thing to keep in mind with that is that it's everything, all things about studying. It's all, it's, it's social economics, it's, it's everything that we're talking about, it's about studying the people, it's about studying what we believed in. Religion, God, households, you know, anything. That's all they did, and so once they studied, they were able to flip everything on us. And then once you became a slave, your mindset, you were stripped of everything that you grew up on, everything that you believed. Your, your belief system was totally dead, because they flipped that on you. So we have to teach each other, and we have to. I'm finding so, so many, many different mentalities mentality today. It seems, it seems hard. hard. It seems it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard, hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a challenge. Is a challenge. challenge. Um, so, so so I'm ready. For I'm ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that I think we all have a purpose in life.